Hello, everyone, and welcome to this presentation on renal disorders. I'm Desmond, and this is brought to you by Newton TV. We'll be covering a range of topics related to the kidneys and their associated diseases. Let's dive right in. Let's start with glomerular filtration rate, or GFR. GFR essentially measures how well your kidneys are filtering your blood. It's directly related to renal perfusion, meaning that if blood pressure or perfusion decreases, so does GFR. Also, keep in mind that GFR naturally declines with age. If your GFR drops, it means your kidneys are struggling. A normal GFR is typically over 90 millimolmin, but if it's below that, you're at risk for kidney disease. The kidneys perform several vital functions. They eliminate waste, maintain acid-base balance, regulate blood pressure through the RAS system, stimulate RBC production, activate vitamin D and regulate calcium levels, and maintain glucose homeostasis. These are crucial for overall health. Here's a quick anatomy and physiology review. This image shows the structure of the kidney and the nephron, its functional unit. Unfiltered blood enters, and the nephron removes waste and recycles water and electrolytes, ultimately producing urine. Let's trace the path of fluid through the nephron. Imagine your kidneys as a highly efficient filtration plant. Inside the kidney, the nephron is the star player. The process starts at the glomerulus, where blood is filtered, flows into Bowman's capsule, then to the proximal tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal tubule, and finally the collecting duct where everything is fine-tuned before it leaves as urine. If there's a breakdown anywhere along this chain, that's when kidney problems show up. This diagram illustrates what happens in each part of the nephron. Different substances are reabsorbed back into the blood or secreted into the filtrate at each stage. Note the role of aldosterone in the distal tubule, which influences sodium and water reabsorption. The kidneys play a critical role in maintaining acid-base balance. They do this by regulating the excretion of hydrogen ions and the reabsorption of bicarbonate. This process helps keep the blood pH within a normal range. The renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, or RAAS, is essential for blood pressure control. When blood pressure drops, the kidneys release renin, which triggers a cascade of events leading to the production of angiotensin II. Let's imagine a clinical scenario. A patient comes in with low blood pressure after a car accident. Their kidneys release renin, which activates angiotensin II, raising blood pressure and helping to restore fluid balance. But if the system gets too active, it can lead to hypertension, a major risk factor for kidney disease, and aldosterone, ultimately increasing blood pressure. For example, imagine a patient with heart failure. When the kidneys can't hold onto enough fluid, this leads to edema and low blood pressure. It's like the body's own traffic jam where too much fluid stays in the wrong places. Erythropoietin, or EPO, is a hormone produced by the kidneys that stimulates red blood cell production. When oxygen levels in the blood are low, the kidneys release EPO, which signals the bone marrow to make more red blood cells, increasing the oxygen-carrying capacity of the blood. Vitamin D is crucial for calcium absorption and bone health. The kidneys play a key role in activating vitamin D into its active form, calcitriol. This active form then facilitates calcium absorption from the intestines and reabsorption from the kidneys. The kidneys also play a role in glucose homeostasis. Normally, all glucose filtered by the glomerulus is reabsorbed. However, in diabetes, high blood glucose levels can overwhelm the kidney's reabsorption capacity, leading to glucose in the urine. Now, let's discuss renal dysfunction. This can be categorized as pre-renal, intra-renal, or post-renal. Pre-renal issues involve decreased blood flow to the kidneys, 
intrarenal issues involve damage within the kidneys themselves, and postrenal issues involve obstruction of urine outflow. Damage to renal tubules, also known as acute tubular necrosis ATN, can also cause renal dysfunction. This diagram visually represents the different types of renal dysfunction. Prerenal refers to decreased blood flow, intrarenal refers to damage within the kidney, and postrenal refers to obstruction of urine outflow. Understanding these distinctions is crucial for diagnosis and treatment. When assessing a patient for renal disorders, it's important to gather a thorough history and look for specific signs and symptoms. This includes inquiring about chronic illnesses, recent infections, medication use, and any changes in urine output or color. CVA tenderness can also be an important indicator. Urinalysis is a key diagnostic tool for evaluating renal function. It can provide valuable information about specific gravity, pH glucose, ketones, protein blood, and other components in the urine. Abnormal values can indicate various renal disorders. Serum creatinine and Boone are important renal function labs. Serum creatinine is a reliable indicator of renal function, while Boone is less specific but can still provide valuable information. Elevated bune can indicate azotemia, which is a buildup of nitrogenous waste products in the blood. Treatment for renal disorders varies depending on the underlying cause and severity. It may include medications to maintain fluid, electrolyte, and acid-base balance, control blood glucose and blood pressure, and ensure adequate RBC production. In severe cases, dialysis or CRRT may be necessary. Glomerulonephritis is an inflammatory condition affecting the glomeruli. It's often triggered by an immunological mechanism such as an autoimmune reaction or a post-streptococcal infection. This inflammation can damage the glomeruli and lead to hyperpermeability. In glomerulonephritis, the damaged glomeruli lead to protein loss, edema, oliguria, and hypervolemia. Post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, or PSGN, is a common cause, and patients may present with dark urine. The image shows how antibodies attack antigens and immune complexes deposit in the glomeruli. Diagnosing glomerulonephritis involves assessing serum creatinine and burn levels, as well as performing a urinalysis to check for protein, WBCs, and blood. Treatment typically includes antibiotics, dietary modifications, and diuretics. Antibodies to streptococcal bacteria may also be present. This illustration summarizes the key aspects of glomerulonephritis. It shows the antigen-antibody complex in the glomeruli, leading to inflammation and decreased GFR. Patients may experience symptoms such as headache, edema, lethargy, and changes in urine output. Nephrotic syndrome is characterized by massive albuminuria, often due to diabetes mellitus, amyloidosis, or lupus. The glomerular damage leads to proteinuria and edema. Hyperlipidemia may also develop as the liver increases lipid synthesis to compensate for urinary protein loss. This image illustrates the process of proteinuria in nephrotic syndrome. Protein is filtered out of the blood at the glomerulus, leading to hypoalbuminemia and decreased colloid oncotic pressure, which causes edema. This illustration summarizes the causes, symptoms, and complications of nephrotic syndrome. It highlights the damaged glomeruli, proteinuria, hypoalbuminemia, and edema. It also mentions the hypercoagulable state and the risk of thrombotic complications. Nephrolithiasis, or kidney stones, involves the formation of calculi in the kidneys. These stones can travel to the ureter, causing urolithiasis. The presentation depends on the stone's location, and the stones are often made of calcium, but can also be struviti, uric acid, or cysteine. This illustration shows the typical pain pattern associated with nephrolithiasis. Patients often experience severe abdominal and flank pain, 
as well as colicky pain caused by ureter spasms. Hematuria and crystalluria are also common findings. Treatment for nephrolithiasis focuses on pain relief, preventing recurrence and UTI, and analyzing the stone composition, high fluid intake, lithotripsy, surgery, and dietary changes may be necessary. Straining urine to catch the stone for analysis is also important. This image depicts a kidney with kidney stones, surrounded by illustrations of common symptoms such as fever, dizziness, stomach pain, and vomiting. Nephrolithiasis can be a very painful and debilitating condition. This diagram provides an overview of kidney stones, including their formation and different types. It explains that kidney stones appear when solutes in the urine precipitate and crystallize. The diagram also shows the urinary system, including the kidneys, ureters, bladder, and urethra. Pyelonephritis is an infection of the renal pelvis. It's often caused by an ascending UTI or stasis of urine. Other factors such as obstructive uropathy, vesicoretoral reflux, and anatomical abnormalities can also contribute. The signs and symptoms of pyelonephritis include fever, abdominal or CVA tenderness, flank pain, nausea and vomiting, chills, dysuria, and urinary frequency. Microscopic hematuria and puria are also common findings. Treatment for pyelonephritis typically involves antibiotics, analgesics, and high fluid intake. It's also important to remove any urological obstruction if present. Prompt treatment is essential to prevent complications. This image summarizes the key aspects of pyelonephritis, including its causes, symptoms, and treatment. It highlights the bacterial infection of the upper urinary tract, systemic symptoms such as fever and flank pain, and the importance of antibiotics. Polycystic kidney disease, or PKD, is a genetic disorder characterized by the formation of fluid-filled cysts in the kidneys and other organs. These cysts impair renal function and can lead to pain, renal calculi, increased blood pressure, and other complications. This illustration provides a comprehensive overview of PKD, including its kidney-related and non-kidney-related complications. It also shows a diagram of a polycystic kidney and a polycystic nephron, illustrating the cysts that characterize the disease. Acute kidney injury, or AKI, is an abrupt insult to the kidney that leads to a rapid decrease in kidney function. It can be caused by pre-renal, intrarenal, or post-renal factors. Azotemia, elevated creatinine, and fluid retention are common signs. This diagram illustrates the stages of AKI, including the initial insult, oliguria, diuresis, and recovery. Each stage is characterized by specific clinical findings and requires appropriate management. This illustration summarizes the key aspects of AKI, including the decrease in kidney function, retention of waste products, and dysregulation of extracellular volume and electrolytes. It also lists the signs and symptoms of each phase of AKI. Chronic renal failure, or CRF, is an irreversible and progressive condition characterized by a gradual onset. It typically progresses to end-stage renal disease, or ESRD, requiring hemodialysis or kidney transplant. Diabetes, hypertension, glomerulonephritis, and PKD are leading causes. This slide lists the various symptoms and complications associated with CRF. These include uremic encephalopathy, proteinuria, edema, fluid overload, electrolyte imbalances, anemia, decreased vitamin D, hypertension, and metabolic acidosis. Treatment for CRF focuses on fluid and electrolyte management as well as blood pressure control. When GFR falls below 10 to 20 mL or men, dialysis or kidney transplant evaluation is necessary. This image provides a detailed overview of the different stages of CRF, including diminished renal reserve, renal insufficiency, and ESRD. Each stage is characterized by specific clinical findings, 
and requires appropriate management. Dialysis may be needed if renal failure cannot be reversed. Indications for dialysis include persistent hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, and fluid volume excess unresponsive to diuretics. The ECG shows potential abnormalities that may be associated with renal failure. Peritoneal dialysis involves filling the peritoneum with the dialysis solution, or dialysate. Wastes and extra fluid are pulled from the blood into the abdominal cavity by the dialysate. The solution is then drained after a dwell time of about four hours. Hemodialysis involves drawing the patient's blood out of the body and passing it through a dialyzer, which removes excess solutes and fluid. The blood is then returned to the body. An arterial venous fistula is commonly created in the arm to facilitate blood access. Thank you for watching this presentation on renal disorders. Be sure to subscribe, like and share this video from Newton TV. We hope you found this informative and helpful.